Welcome back. I'm Andrew, your crypto guy on the internet. And we have some good news. We got a little bit of a relief rally on the horizon here. There's some good news, some bad news, and two news stories I want to show you that I found both terrifying and amusing. So let's first look at Bitcoin. Uh, right now, uh, we're on our way up to our $35,000 target that I predicted a couple videos ago. I'm thinking by the first or second week of June, Bitcoin should be back at 35,000. Now why? Because we had a CME gap back on May 6th and we do have to, we usually fill those gaps at a later date, but not that much later. So I'm thinking based on where we're going now, we should hit that $35,000 target in I say first or second week of June. At some point in June, we're going to hit 35,000 to fill that gap. Now after that, that's anybody's guess. I think we get rejected. We hit 35,000 and we get rejected because the macro picture hasn't changed. There are a lot of YouTubers that are saying, oh, this is the start of the reversal. Look at all these charts that show that 25,000 was the bottom. All these Bitcoin bulls, all these other stories. I'm like, okay, sure. But the only way to confirm a Bitcoin reversal is to have a daily close above 40,000. All right, and that's a ways off. That's some hopium. And that generally won't happen until some of these major stories change around us. I'm just being realistic. Now, anything that, that can happen, but it's it's very likely that we hit 35,000 to fill that gap. After that, you're on your own, all right? Now, what happened with Luna? Luna 2.0, this is the, probably the last we're gonna talk about Luna for a while, but a, a lot of people are wondering. The Luna 2.0 token launched, okay, and People who had the original Luna got uh, some Luna 2 tokens given to them on their exchange. So the original Luna was now renamed to Terra Classic. And uh, the people who held Terra Classic now is what it's called, got awarded some Luna 2 tokens. Okay, If you were on Kraken or something that had the original Luna on it. Now if you were on Coinbase or Gemini, you have Wrapped Luna. Wrapped Luna is like a clone of the real Luna that's tied to the exact same price because it's an, an Ethereum network. So it's an ERC-20 token representing Luna. So if you have Wrapped Luna, you're not getting Luna 2.0 tokens given to you for free. At least not yet. That might change in the future. So Coinbase, as far as I know, has delisted Luna, or now called Terra Classic, because they got burned. They don't like the, the Luna story. They're trying to stay on the up and up over at Coinbase, okay? And I get it. Binance, CZ, got burned for like $1.6 billion from the UST collapse. So why would you buy Luna 2.0? Well, Luna... Terra Labs is a pile of brilliant developers, and they have a huge ecosystem of excellent decentralized applications. But what made them valuable originally was their algorithmic stablecoin, UST. That's what pushed them all the way up to like top five cryptos. And when UST collapsed because it was exploited from the outside, um, $60 billion vanished in like two days, so a lot of people got burned. I lost a couple grand, but that was offset off the stuff I, I made earlier. So I kind of broke even on Luna, which is kind of a bummer. And they've given me some of these new Luna 2 tokens. But as you can see, a lot of people have sold them off to try to recoup some of their losses. I'm not excited about $8, though. So I'm just going to sit on my Terra Classic and my Luna 2.0, and maybe something good will happen. That's the best. If you have wrapped Luna, just wait. It's not worth selling. It's not worth anything. So maybe in the future, hopium case here, Luna 2 does well, and then, you know, everybody comes around. Gemini, Coinbase, I go, okay, Luna's proven their metal. It's been a year since the problem. I think we can work with them. And if Terra Classic, in the meantime, is burning off all of those excess coins that were thrown into the system by the old algorithm, that could bring back some value to the original Luna coin. So that's the best case scenario. Bottom line is, forget about it. Don't. It's not worth selling. You're not going to get anything. So just keep it in the dark corner of your portfolio and mentally move on to other things. All right? Now... Amazon, remember I was harping everybody about that? 
Look at Amazon, my man, doing quite well. Now, that split is coming up on the 6th. I think the deadline to participate in the split was May 27th. But um, usually when these splits happen, the stock price, um, first it gets divided by 20, because one share becomes 20 shares that are worth 20 times less. But because they're so cheap, you bring in a lot of new investors, and that bumps the price up per share quite a bit, usually. So I think if you have Amazon, you have some green times for you in the future. So I'm happy for you. Um, and then we, ha we got some good news. Uh, China is, re is relaxing its COVID restrictions for now until COVID-20 and 50 come out next week. But Shanghai and Beijing have opened up again so the starving people can go back to work. Oh, thank you, government. So we might see supply chain issues and supplies in general um, loosen up a little bit from China in about nine months. So that's some distant good news. Now, I saw two stories today uh, on the news that kind of scared me, but it was also kind of funny in a dark way. So the first one was... Gene Sperling. He's a senior advisor to Biden, but really his claim to fame was he was the coordinator of the American Rescue Plan. Now, the American Rescue Plan was uh, last year when you would tell the government what, what kind of loser you were, and then they would send you a check uh, of money that they just printed out of thin air. Remember, Rand Paul back then was like, don't you do that. It's going to cause inflation problems. You send them a little money like you're a hero, and then next year it's going to cost them 10 times the money. It's going to be way worse for them if you do this. And they were like, ah, shut up, Rand, you hate poor people. Well, now we're seeing the result of policies like this, okay? Inflationary policies. Now you're getting bit in the ass over this stuff. Anyway, so we have Gene Sperling, and his job is to calm the fears of all the inflation, okay? So he's been around. He's been on CNN, MSNBC, and they're concerned about gas prices there too. And so they go, gee, what are we gonna do? Stuff is, it's $8 a gallon here in Los Angeles. Do we have a plan? And Gene goes, don't you worry. Me and the rest of the Biden administration are doing everything we can. And CNN was like, well, that's good for me. Thanks for uh, coming by, Gene. We'll see you next week. And he's like, all right. And he leaves. So then Gene goes on Fox News with the same plan. Remember, Fox News hates Joe Biden simply because he's on the left. And they've been putting all of these problems, like the baby formula shortage, the gas prices, the incredible transition kind of showing that these gas prices are artificially increased through the no drilling pro uh, policies that Biden's come up with, and that this is a forced pain. This is a fake pain that should not exist at these levels. Now, we do have real problems, right? COVID and Russia and Chinese lockdowns, and there are problems that will cause inflation, but it's it's been exacerbated multiple times over by our policies here, and that needs to be changed and can be changed. So Gene comes on to Fox News, and they're like, Gene, Shit's bad. What's the plan? And Gene goes, well, don't you worry. We're doing everything we can. And this lady with her stone-cold gaze and this guy who's not helping him goes, yeah, you're clearly not doing the best you can. You're doing the best you can uh, to ruin everything. Like, we see what you're doing. I know you're lying. So what's the plan? What's the real plan? What are you going to do? And Gene goes, um... Okay, well, uh, we're going to release more oil from the strategic reserves. And this lady goes, that's not a plan. That's, she didn't say this, but that's basically pawning your microwave to get a burrito. And then you eat your burrito. And then the next day you're hungry again, and now you have no microwave. The strategic reserves are not to be given to the public. That's to make sure that we have fuel for our tanks and our airplanes if we were to be invaded, if our refineries were to be blown up from remote missiles from Russia, we would still have a strategic reserve of fuel to power our military. And so Biden is dumping that to lower the price of gas at the pump by a nickel for two days. And then we're out of reserves when we're facing a hot war with Russia and or China on the horizon. You're dumping our reserves? What are you doing? That's not a plan. And so Gene goes... Uh, oh, shit, that didn't work either. Um, okay, well, Joe Biden's having a, a meeting with Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, right? 
and they're, they're going to talk about inflation. They'll tell you all the answers. They're going to answer all the questions. We have a plan. Don't worry. And so these two go, all right, we'll see how that meeting goes. Thanks for coming by, Gene. We'll see you next time. And he goes, ah, and he leaves. And then, <laughs> well, that meeting didn't really add up to much. So um, real quick, it was about, they had their meeting. And then the press conference afterward that was supposed to answer all the burning questions was about 90 seconds. So Joe, who's barely awake, reads from a card and he says, I'm just going to let Jerome Powell do his job. I'm not going to not going to bother him. And that's the plan. And then afterwards, there's an eruption of reporters asking questions like Joe, Joe, what, 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 like how it usually is. Right. But instead of taking questions, there's White House staff around Joe that yells over the reporters and forces them out of the room. This is crazy. It's almost like you're not allowed to talk to him. Because whenever Joe speaks, we have to walk it back. It's a problem for us. So you don't get to ask your president any questions. Watch this. Continue to do. My job as president is not to uh, nominate, highly, not only nominate highly, highly qualified individuals for that institution, but to give them the space they need to do their job. I'm not going to interfere with their critically important work. The Fed has dual responsibilities. One, full employment. Two, stable prices. Chair Powell and other leaders of the Fed have noted at this moment they have a laser focus on addressing inflation, just like I am. And with a larger complement of board members now confirmed, I know we'll use those tools of monetary policy to address the rising uh, prices for the American people. So I look forward to uh, Chairman Powell's continued leadership at the Fed, and I look forward to the Senate considering my final nominee to the board, uh, Michael Barr, in the near future. And uh, that's why we're meeting folks, and thank you for coming in. Thank you. Mr. President, why do you think thank there you. is let's a go. Go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, guys. Thank you. Let's go. Let's go. That's all he's allowed to say. Don't ask him any questions. Leave. Okay, you heard what you need to hear. Go. President Biden meeting with. That's all we get. So Joe Biden's plan for inflation is uh, I'm just going to let Jerome Powell uh, do his job. Jerry's the numbers guy, so he, he's going to do the numbers. Now, that's fair. Joe Biden isn't a businessman. He's been a politician his whole life. So he's only spent taxpayer money. He doesn't know how to handle numbers or economies. So he's just going to go, let Jerome Powell do it, because that's technically his job, right? Um, and this way, if it doesn't go well, I can just blame him. It'll be fine. Now, <laughs> by contrast, when Trump was president, remember, he originally appointed Jerome Powell. And at one point during Trump's presidency, the market wasn't doing very well. And so Trump picked up the phone and went, Jerome, what the hell? I'm looking at my stocks, not looking good. What are you doing about it? And Jerome goes, well, you know, there's, you know, we're working on the race. He's like, that's not good enough. You fix this now or I'll fire you. And Jerome's like, you, you can't fire me. I'm not, I will figure out a way to fire you, Jerry. Figure it out today. And he goes, oh, maybe I'll lower interest rates. He goes, that's more like it. And then the market went back to being great. So, yet yeah, you're not supposed to squeeze the Fed, but Trump did it, and things stayed cheap, <laughs> so for better or worse, where Joe doesn't even, he's just like, oh, whatever they tell me to say, okay, and then you can't even ask him a question. That's sad, all right? And so CNBC, which is normally on Biden's side to a certain degree, they're kind of centrist left, they saw this, and they wrote an article going like, yeah, it's not looking good. It's all the problems at once. School's getting shot up. Nobody has money. Things are way more expensive than they should be, even with all these problems. We got two major adversaries looking to fight us, and this guy's in charge. Not good, all right? Really, I feel bad for Joe Biden. Like, he's not in control, okay? So, really, he should just go home and just 
be with his grandkids while he still can. Like, don't make him do this anymore, all right? It's not good for him. It's not good for us. And if we're looking at a hot war with Russia or China on the horizon, like, I don't want him in charge. And not like he is now, but I don't want him to look like he is at all. Like, it's just not a good look. So what's the future for us here? We're in the middle of a little bit of a, a relief rally, but overall the story is still pretty grisly, okay? It's going to keep getting worse after this little relief rally unless something major changes. Um, Russia, they're sending their oil to China and India instead, which is strengthening their, their half of the world and not Europe or the United States, while we continue to bicker and moan amongst each other. Um, our adversaries are getting stronger in the middle of it. So it's it's not um, looking very bright for the U.S. Uh, on any of these problems. So, like, what's on the horizon? How could we solve this? There would have to be a major shakeup in who's in the White House, okay? So midterm elections will help a little bit, but 2024 is going to be Republican rule, okay? It's going to be Republicans for like 8 to 12 years after this, like post-Jimmy Carter, where it's like a hard swing to the other side, okay? Now, will that solve the problems? Uh, I don't know. It, it'll have an effect, right? The underlying shadow problems of globalism is still there, and that's not going anywhere. But I feel like the Republicans would go, start drilling now, okay? And just, they don't care. Like, fix this no matter what it takes, and so it's going to be uh, a correction. Things are generally cheaper under Republican rule. Things were kind of pricey under George W., but that's from Dick Cheney's infinite wars in the Middle East, so he could profit off them, right? But we don't talk about that. Gas was expensive under Obama, but nowhere near as expensive as it is now. And that's not because there's not enough oil. There's plenty of oil. We keep finding more. There's plenty of oil, as long as you drill for it, and we're not doing that. And that's just exacerbating all of the problems we currently have. No, I'm not against a green transition. That's great. We should have that. And in a vacuum, that seems like a good idea. But not when you have two major adversaries that are not kneecapped by this environmentalist idea, this Green New Deal idea. They will continue to empower themselves. Okay, They're not worried about plastic straws. And if we are, that severely weakens us. And we're hyperinflated and we're trying to do it. You're bickering with pronouns and shooting up your own schools. Meanwhile, Russia and China is just going to be like, boom, just take us out real easy. Okay, And that's what is uh, on the horizon for us unless there's a major change in the White House. So that's something to look forward to. As for Bitcoin, just to recap, yeah, we're probably looking at 35000 is fill in that CME gap. We'll make some short-term profits, but overall things are still pretty bad. Anyway, good luck out there. I'm with you no matter what.